for a little bit so we can go ahead and get started. I'm sure others will join us um, as we're moving forward. So happy Wednesday. My name is Carrington Lott. I'm the Deputy Director at Systems for Action, which is a national research program office of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We at Systems for Action are housed at the Colorado School of Public Health um, and the Health Systems Management and Policy Department. And we host these bi-weekly research and progress webinar series where the Systems for Action grantees come and present um, on their research projects. So typically they'll come in the beginning of their project and then in the middle and also present again at the end when they have some final findings. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from the Systems for Action grantee, the Morehouse School of Medicine with their partner, Redemption and Advancement Alliance. They're gonna be talking to you about their Systems for Action research project titled Research to Understand Systems of Housing, Feasibility and Acceptability of Aligning Systems for Fathers. So this team applied for a funding opportunity back in 2022 and their project started up in 2023. Um, they applied for a developmental award, which means that they were doing a 12 month pilot study. So they are in the final stages of their project and wrapping up and I'm sure they're gonna have some wonderful updates for us. Um, and they have presented about a year ago from today. Um, so we're excited that you have all joined us to hear from them. So right now we're in the welcome. Um, and then as soon as I wrap up here with a couple of more administrative things I wanna note, we'll hand the presentation over to the team at Morehouse. I think Dr. Latrice Rollins is gonna get us started and she'll do an introduction of her team members and um, they will take turns presenting to you what they have learned and what they've been doing for this past year. And then we'll hear commentary from Chris White. And then at the end of the session, we'll have time for questions and answers. So two administrative notes. Um, one is that today's session is recorded. So we will send out an email with the recording as well as a PDF of the team's presentation slides, um, probably tomorrow, maybe maybe Friday, definitely before the end of the week. Um, and then the second thing is that we have a Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. I'm sure you're all very familiar, familiar with Zoom at this point, but if you have any questions that pop up at any point during the webinar, um, please locate the Q&A box, jot your question down, and we will make sure that we have time to address it at the end of today's session. Okay, with that, I am going to hand it over to Dr. Rollins. Excellent, thank you so much, Carrie. All right. And so, yeah, thank you for this opportunity to share. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the webinar. Um, as you shared, my name is Latrice Rollins, and I'm an assistant professor at Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, I'm honored to serve as the principal investigator for this important work. Um, I'm also a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, cultural health leader. So I'm grateful for the foundation's investment in me and particularly my work around fatherhood. So I'm going to turn it over to Thomas to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. My name is Thomas Cotton, and I'm the founder and CEO of Redemption and Advancement Alliance. I am also um, a part of Fathers Matter ATL, um, where we address mass incarceration. Um, and I'm grateful to be a Morehouse School of Medicine grad and uh, so many other things. And we'll pass it on to Lisa Yeomans. Yeomans. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Yomis. I'm the founder of Change Gonna Come, where our mission is to build the walls of our community by building the lives of our people. I'm also a co-lead with the Addressing Mass Incarceration Strategy for Fathers Matter ATL and the project coordinator for the Rush Project. Awesome. All right, so we are all, as Thomas and Lisa shared, we're all leaders of Fathers Matter ATL. And um, this is a multi-sector group of fathers, academics, community-based organizations, education, health and human service leaders, faith-based leaders, business leaders, just a number of sectors um, coming together to promote and support father engagement. And this is done through seven strategies that were collaboratively identified in 2021 at our inaugural Fatherhood Leadership Summit. And um, the image that you see on the right, the graph, um, that is what emerged from our Fatherhood Leadership Summit showing this is a collective vision. Here are all of the um, strategies and ways that we need to actually get to that vision to develop a system that really equitably serves fathers. And so um, one of the strategies as they shared is addressing mass incarceration, um, which is led by Thomas and Lisa. And it focuses on engagement of fathers who are affected by the justice system. 
um, our, that's just kind of one area, but that's not the, you know, all only fathers affected by the justice system is not the total focus of Fathers Matter ATL. This is just um, one strategy. Um, but this particular group meets uh, monthly and someone actually reached out to this group for help for a father. And that kind of sparked this interest and work with um, fathers and housing. And so I'll let Thomas talk about how that came about. And you all, if you want to, you can scan the QR code um, on the left. And that really takes you to the Fathers Matter ATL website to get more information about the initiative too. As Dr. Rollins um, explained, we are a number of different strategy, um, organizations coming together for multiple strategies. Um, when we think about all the strategies we have and we we're looking at the fatherhood, um, different areas of fatherhood and how we can help, there was a gentleman that came to us that was a custodial father. And as he was looking for housing, he was homeless and he was looking for support. We were able to help them in a lot of different areas, but when it came to housing, none of the strategies could find a way of helping this person immediately. And so we began to look at ways that we can help fathers that are custodial fathers looking for um, shelter, looking for emergency housing first, but per more permanent housing later. Um, and so as we began to look at this, we were able to find a way of of doing emergency housing through our strategies for this individual, but we embarked on a way of doing more permanent housing. So we created a list that will allow us to um, provide emergency support for fathers in this situation. But then, you know, what are some of the barriers that we are facing when it comes to having fathers placed more permanently? And so uh, that's what led to us um, engaging in this research. You know, there's many different uh, ways of getting research and information, but prior to us going into this, um, we did some research that found that a lot of fathers here that, you know, when they go look for uh, support and services, they hear, sorry, there's nothing we can do, or there's nothing available for you. So especially those that, are, uh, that have incarceration in their background or justice impacted, um, there's a lot of different challenges that they face. So uh, we wanted to find out what are some of the barriers to housing and see that if there are ways that we can create a system that will work better uh, to serve fathers. Awesome. And I'm trying to steal a little bit of our thunder, but I want to turn it over to Lisa, who's going to talk some more about um, just some background on the issue. Lisa, we can't hear you. Oh, my apologies. Thank you. African Americans make up 13% of the general population, but more than 40% of those experiencing homelessness. The disproportionality of homelessness is a byproduct of systemic inequity. Also, the lingering effects of racism continue to perpetuate disparities in critical areas that impact rates of homelessness. And other causes are poverty, rental housing discrimination, access to quality health care, and incarceration. So all those services and policies addressing homelessness and homelessness in the U.S. expand, continue to expand. Fathers experiencing homelessness remain an underserved subgroup, and this is in part because providers serving homeless families generally focus on women and children. And an example of this would be that many shelters serving homeless families do not welcome adult men or male children ages 12 years and older. So while it is known that most of the homeless population are men, it is less known that 41% of men who are experiencing homelessness are in fact parents and about 16% of sheltered families include a father. This goes back to the previous example of most shelters serving homeless families not welcoming adult men and or fathers. And this is due to the lack of accessible services and lack of coordination among shelters, organizations, and government agencies to help fathers as most are for women and children. And therefore the family is often separated. Next slide. 
Homelessness among single father families is also a growing phenomenon in our society with numbers in the US increasing from 1.7 million in 1990 to 3.3 million in 2020. Many single fathers with children have a difficult time finding shelters that take men with children and those who do accommodate them are typically at capacity. Further programs that offer more permanent housing solution for fathers and families are limited. In Atlanta, there is only one one shelter that accepts fathers with their families. In 2022, 15% of active clients in the Atlanta Housing Management Information System were fathers, of which 53% being single fathers and 93% identifying as Black, African American, or African. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, so, yeah, so that just really lifts up the issue of, you know, with single fathers being one of the fastest growing populations um, in the United States, we really need to start looking at um, how our resources and services are um, reaching out to this population as well. Um, this is not to say that, you know, resources are not needed for women and children. We understand that. Uh, we're also just saying make sure that services are inclusive um, for fathers who are taking care of their children as well or their families. So um, with this project, we used two different frameworks to guide our work, um, first being community-based participatory research or CBPR, um, which is a model that Thomas and I have used for at least uh, seven years of us working together now. And so CBPR is a research approach that really involves those directly affected by a topic or an issue in all phases of the research from the planning all the way to the dissemination um, of the results. And so this model shows that there are some considerations that must be taken into account first um, for the approach to be successful. And that includes understanding the context of the community that you're seeking to assist. Um, there can be political, structural, social factors that impact the community and that also shape the issue at hand. Um, if there are any, polyvent, any relevant policies that need to be considered, um, you also want to look at those. You also want to look at the capacity of the researcher as well as the capacity of the community um, to really be ready for um, working together um, and collaborating and building a trusting foundation to actually do the work. Um, there are also partnership, process, partnership processes that are very important um, and making sure that you identify the right partners um, can really make or break the project and really um, impact the level of um, outcomes and things that you seek to achieve. And so this model really highlights um, multi-sector partnerships. As you see in the middle, they talk about CBO, so community-based organizations, funders, the agency, um, community partners, academic government, healthcare, um, similar to the model that we are talking about and implementing today. So it's important to have a number of different folks um, at the table and, and involved in decision-making. But um, overall, uh, CBPR has been found to lead to more positive outcomes um, than traditional research approaches, particularly because of the capacity building, the social justice and the action aspects of the approach um, really lead to, again, more positive outcomes than we find and quicker than we would find in traditional research approaches. Um, Thomas, is there anything you wanna add? Just that when we went into this research project, we wanted to make sure that as we go into this, we want it to be led by the community. So CBPR was um, a very important part of our, our concept because we wanted to hear from community one. We wanted to hear from those who are um, providing support and services and make sure that we are on the right track. Um, we know that in research that housing is absolutely necessary for, for men um, that are custodial parents but we want to make sure that we uh, included the voice of the community and other uh, practitioners in order to make sure that our research was gonna be solid. Our theories would continue to withstand um, when we're going out and getting the information. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, in addition to the CBPR conceptual model, we also use um, what's called the EPIS framework. The E stands for exploration, P is for preparation, I implementation, and S for sustainment. Um, EPIS describes four well-defined phases that align with and guide the implementation process. Um, it also helps to identify levels within and across 
um, systems and within organizations. So again, really understanding the context um, of organizations and that you're trying to work with and implement, particularly something new. Um, there can be a number of different factors, um, those bridging and innovation factors um, that have to do with just how they impact the outer um, and inner context of various interventions in organizations. And so um, in the exploration phase, you are working with that particular organization um, for us, you know, the various partners and really getting an understanding of the type of clients or patients um, and communities that they serve and work with. What are the existing needs? How do they address those needs um, and decide whether adopting um, this new approach that we're proposing, if that's something that will work with their um, population as well as with their organization. In the preparation phase, you're working with them to really understand any barriers and facilitators to implementing this new approach and looking at all of those contextual factors um, that we, we talked about, whether it's um, leadership, whether it's funding, whether it's um, patient needs, just looking at what different types of things may actually impact the implementation or what things, you know, whether it's supportive or whether they may um, produce a barrier. Uh, when we're actually looking at the implementation phase, we, you know, implement. <laughs> so going ahead and initiating the system and seeing um, how it works and testing out to see um, how people are receiving, how the partners are experiencing the system, how your um, patients or clients are experiencing and making modifications as you go. And then with sustainment, um, as you're learning um, what things are working and what things are not, you're you know, tweaking and figuring out, you know, how can we make this a part of the routine um, delivery of services? And especially as you learn things that work, you want to see how you can get those things implemented and things yeah, that are not, stronger, I feel very offended. You want to adapt. <laughs> so um, sustainment is, you know, obviously the key uh, for everything that we do, particularly if it's, it's something that's effective and working. All right, and I'll turn it over to Thomas to talk about this systems alignment approach that we are implementing with the Rush project, which is called Functional Zero. So within the framework, we're looking at this system alignment approach of Functional Zero. Um, when again, we're focused on fathers and fatherhood. And so when we think of our Functional Zero homelessness approach, there is an overall Functional Zero for homelessness. Uh, for our strategy though, we're aimed at it's the same aim of functional zero for the, the whole, but for us and the focus that we have, we, we want to make sure that we look at it from the standpoint of the definition, which is basically eradicating homelessness to ensure it becomes rare, brief, and non-repeating. So it's important when we think about functional zero, we want absolute zero, of course. We want no one to be unhoused. We want everybody to have a way of finding housing, but this strategy allows us to slow homelessness down because it makes it rare, brief, and non-repeating. What it does is it creates, um, ensures there's a number of homeless people that are out there, homeless fathers for us, and it surpasses the community's capacity to provide permanent housing, meaning that there's enough housing to engage the fathers so that they can have a place. And that as this ongoing effort continues, it's continuously monitoring, and so when we look at the local conditions and as they're changing, the ability to house fathers continues to change. So they go, they may go from emergency housing to more permanent housing, but there's a process. And what it basically means is all the fathers will eventually have housing and on an ongoing monitoring support, there's no one within a calendar month that's unhoused. And so that's functional zero. So traditional homelessness relies on short-term interventions like shelters, uh, maybe soup, kitchen, soup kitchens, but Functional Zero, it seeks to permanently end homelessness by prioritizing divisions, prevention, and swift, effective interventions. And so that last part is very important, swift, effective interventions. And that's what we're looking to do as we're building out our system and our systems alignment approach. We're looking to make sure that the interventions actually meet the needs of the father. And as we'll learn later, it actually sees the fathers because that's a lot of times where we're missing, um, we're dropping the ball at. So this systematic approach involves collaboration between our nonprofits, our local government and community stakeholders. 
But as we are going to continue to build this out, there has to be more of a systems alignment. And we have to have a way of communicating with each other. Next slide, Latrice, Dr. Rollins. And so as we start to begin to look at this functional zero, it's person-centered, it's data-driven. And so we're not just out there thinking that this needs to happen. We understand that there's a person center, but as we spoke before, CBPR allows our partners to be a part of this process, to speak into it. And so as we begin to look at this data-driven approach, um, we have to look at a lot of the different preventative ways of, that are already out there and see what we can use to help us to engage um, ours, uh, our population. And so um, we have to look at this system-wide approach, which is functional for our fathers. And as we're gonna talk about here, this all leads to a, a by name list, but I'm not, Dr. Rollins is gonna speak about that here soon. But what I want us to hear is that when it, it comes to those experiencing homelessness, we have to appropriate resources and housing solutions, but a lot of times it's better, it's easier said than done. But if we're creating a system that aligns this approach, it allows us to continue to move it forward and support the fathers, especially those who are custodial or highly interactive fathers that are unhoused, because we have to think about the multiple, multiple sections that are out there that can deal with this, that engage this type of father. And so as we create this strategy or as we research this strategy, we can see that there's different ways we can strategically connect providers to improve inequities among their fragmented systems. Um, so that we can now connect these fathers with additional resources that can possibly support them to getting permanent housing. Yeah, I think the, the other part to really highlight is that there needs to be a system in place. Um, and so in addition to having the lived experience, but the homeless serving system, that's what's really needed and making sure that government and public systems understand the importance of housing needs and make those needed resources available and accessible. Both are important for it to be available. It's important for housing to be available. And it's also important for individuals to have access. Um, it doesn't make sense if they have access, but then there's nothing available. So all of these things have to be working together. And so as Thomas said, we have, um, a core component of the functional zero approach is having a by name list. And we're gonna walk through the steps of the functional zero approach. And um, this main activity of developing your by name list is really knowing who is experiencing homelessness in your community. So who are those fathers in the city of Atlanta that are without housing? Um, and so this list is called by name. Um, it really helps people to understand where people are, um, how they are moving through the system um, from homeless to house, helps us to keep a robust, a robust set of data points um, to really help with coordinating um, the needs um, across these different dads from inflow to outflow. And so again, these are the steps. I'm not going to walk through all 10 um, in the interest of time, but we're going to explain them, how we implemented them throughout the project as we go along. And so, as I said, the first one was the by name list, which was critical. We are still really refining and working and building um, that by name list of fathers in Atlanta. Um, but it was truly important, first of all, amongst our partners and team to understand what the by name list um, is as well as why um, it's important to make sure that we have it. We watched some short videos that were developed by the um, creators of the Functional Zero approach um, with our team, and we really worked to educate ourselves and um, the team on how this by name list could look, um, particularly when we're working with fathers. And so I walk through the steps as we as we go through. Um, but Thomas, tell us a bit about the coordinated access system. So the coordinated access system is a community-wide system that streamlines the process for people experiencing homelessness to access housing. It supports um, the essential steps and makes it smarter, faster. And so when we think about someone who's experiencing homelessness, we don't want them to have to wait and wait to hear back. And can we um, wait for us to contact somebody? We need a system that allows us this community wide. And so we began to look for a system. We were going to create a system at first that allowed this coordinated access. 
Um, but we we know that there's tools out there. So we, um, as we continue to go through it, this integrated system provided the key services um, for someone who's experiencing this homelessness, like I said. We need to also address other needs. So within the system, we were looking at ways that we can build it. And we'll talk more about the system that we came up with, um, but it's just about communities being consistent in the process for which people are experiencing homelessness. Um, we want to know that there's a housing first approach. That was most important also, because as we start to look at the housing first approach, we think about the coordinated access system. Um, through our, the city of Atlanta, the Partners for Home was one of the places that, one of the uh, organizations that we work with that had another, the coordinated access system for homelessness. But then we also had to need, we needed the real-time data, we needed the supply and demand for housing. And so finding this information was important. So as we began to grow this uh, research out, we started finding different ways of engaging this research and the information that we needed. Um, but we just, most importantly, it needs to be housing first and it's a community-wide system that streamlines the process for people experiencing homelessness. Yeah, and this concept of coordinated access is unique to Functional Zero. Typically, when we're talking about homelessness in our cities and states, we're talking about a coordinated entry, um, a coordinated entry system. And so with the Functional Zero approach, they're saying, you know, it's not just about entering the system. We want people to exit. We want people to be supported as well. Um, and so the Functional Zero approach talks about all of the supports that an individual needs um, to, you know, really meet everything, um, meet all of their needs. And there, there is that focus on housing first, but there's, uh, because you have the person's name, you know who they are, you're supporting them holistically um, and making sure that, again, if there are continued experiences with homelessness. They're brief, they're, you know, rare, but we're really trying to, again, eliminate. And so with that, there needs to be coordinated access, not just coordinated entry. Okay, I'm going to turn it to Lisa to now, after you heard all the background on our approaches and the frameworks, uh, we're really going to get into the details of what we um, have done and, and are continuing to do. So you hear about our, our big, hairy, audacious goal, as they say, um, to end homelessness for fathers. But um, go ahead, Lisa. So again, our goal is to end homelessness for fathers in the metro Atlanta area. And our objectives were to um, identify strengths and also gaps in the existence, existing system um, and to improve and see what it was that we will be able to improve upon so that the fathers that come to us will be able to receive the, the help and the assistance and also the resources that they needed in order to be uh, reunited with their children and families. Also to ad adapt our existing systems to facilitate the identification of fathers experiencing homelessness using our by name list. Um, most time when fathers are going to the different organizations, they're not even being identified as such as the father of their children that are taking care of their children. So it's really to just make aware the, the organization that our fathers are going to, that they have an issue just as well as any mother with their children looking for housing also. And then finally to examine the feasibility and acceptability of the adapted system and alignment approach through the pilot study with fathers experiencing homelessness served by our medical public health and social service partners. Thank you. And so here's um, the first step of the functional zero approach is to form your team. And so this is our team of medical social services and public health um, partners. And um, I don't, I'm gonna need to read that to you, but um, the, these are the folks that we're working with to test this functional zero approach and um, system. With the CBPR approach, it's important for us to have leaders from father serving agencies and those who are or have experienced um, homelessness. And so we have um, our six champions who are working with us and you'll hear from one of our champions, Chris White, shortly. Um, but this team, they, you know, we work together also with the medical, social service and public health partners. Um, we meet, met bi-monthly and sometimes monthly to advance this work. 
Um, they helped to make sure that the instruments that we were using to um, conduct interviews and collect data that they were appropriate and that we were asking the right questions um, to really get at the root of why do we have so many homelessness initiatives and so many affordable housing things. And when someone approaches us, a father particularly approaches us and says that they need assistance, we are running into all kinds of barriers and we can't get someone served quickly. And so um, they're helping us to ask the right questions and to um, make sure that we have a system that's effective. So we conducted interviews with each of our partners, um, the medical social services and public health partners to better understand their processes and their systems for identifying, for assessing and referring fathers because as Thomas and Lisa first pointed out, um, a lot of times the systems are used to um, serving mothers and children. And so, you know, a, a lot of times they it's just, well, a man is coming in for services and they don't ask those questions to see um, if they have children with them or, or any of those things. And then two, um, the fathers, righteous, you know, rightfully so, are cautious about saying too much because they're, you know, they're homeless, they're, they're homeless, they're without um, housing. And if you say too much, maybe, you know, their children may be at risk of being taken away from them or all of those different things. And so you just really are trying to understand from those partners, how do they assess um, the needs of, of particularly men coming in for services? How do they monitor data? And then how do they um, also track any outcomes of the work that they're doing. And so we learned a lot and we also confirmed a lot from these conversations. And so the three common themes that we found um, across the partners was that there is a lack of father data. Um, there isn't really a way to just pull and say how many fathers are included. Um, we were able to get some data out of the HMIS system that showed, you know, this is a a male and they have children with them. And then we were able to get some data to disaggregate by race and different things like that. But asking our partners, can you pull that? Um, not really. <laughs> and so uh, that that was a challenge just in terms of being able to track and, you know, for us in terms of listing people by name, who in your system is, you know, experiencing homelessness and who what fathers are experiencing homelessness and how have they been helped? That would take some work to try to figure that out. Um, you can pick men, you can pick, you know, by race, but all those men fathers, that was kind of um, tricky. Also, there was a lack of intention, as we said about, you know, particularly serving and documenting fathers. Again, we understand that uh, when people come in, they have a need, you're seeing them as individuals. Um, however, there really needs to be intentionality, um, particularly when you're, you're working with fathers. One, men are typically not um, seeking services and things like that. So you kind of, and not trusting as well, uh, rightfully so, as I said, not trusting. And so there needs to be some intention around the ways that uh, men are assessed and questions are asked and things like that um, in a way that those, those services that they receive and needs that they present are documented. Um, and so all of the partners agreed that there is a need for comprehensive referral and tracking. A lot of them did not necessarily have a um, system for referrals. There's a lot of, you know, just picking up the phone and, and calling trusted, you know, um, partners that they have, um, not really a clear way of tracking um, outcomes of that approach. And so they did agree that there was a need for a comprehensive system as well as staff who could man such a system. And so um, we felt that, you know, we were in the right, going in the right direction in terms of putting something in place that would align these partners um, so they could send referrals to each other, they can identify these fathers, et cetera. So according to the steps of the functional zero approach, we also have to clarify our scope. And we have to be clear about when we say someone experiencing homelessness, what does that mean? Because based on the interviews and in informal conversations that we've had with service providers, sometimes the definition that they have of homelessness can be a barrier to the services. So if they are not literally on the street or literally in um, a car or something like that and sleeping, they don't fit the definition of homelessness, but we understand that there can be a um, broader definition. And so we use the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, the WIOA language to develop a, a, a definition of homelessness uh, with our coalition 
And so you can see here, it's not just an individual that's sleeping on the street, um, but it can be just anyone who is at risk of, you know, basically doesn't have a fixed regular um, residence. And so this is what we use to um, define homelessness. We also, uh, once we had the definition, we then decided on um, what would be the criteria for the fathers that we were going to focus on, particularly with this project. Um, as Lisa said early on, we know that the majority of folks experiencing homelessness are men. We know that there is a large number of men who are fathers, um, but that can be a range of different things. It could be a father who has adult children that are, you know, maybe they're not connected to, but you know, there's a lot of different scenarios that can happen, um, but we really wanted to focus in on those fathers that have their children with them, um, whether they're custodial or whether they're a part of a family. Um, and there's just, yeah, the housing is the issue. So we wanted to focus on that population um, because we're um, working with the Atlanta content, um, coordinated entry system. We wanted to make sure that they are in the city of Atlanta because if they're not, then they we have to work with another system to refer them and things. So we're, we're focusing in on the city of Atlanta and making sure that they meet the definition of homelessness that we described before. And I'm going to turn it over to Thomas to talk about the Unite Us Georgia system and the homelessness management information system. And so we, um, as the next step in the functional zero approach, is to develop a data infrastructure as well as agreements. And so, as Thomas said, we we did have a system that Fathers Matter ATL was developing and seeing how we could internally um, share referrals and report to each other. But um, when you start to deal with um, medical care associations and you know um, public health systems and things like that, you really need something that. Um, is acceptable to them and something that they can use and would be secure. And so instead of developing something, we thought it would better to um, use a common existing system. And so Unite Us um, was one that several of our partners were using. And so um, I'll turn it over to Thomas to talk about this some more. Yeah, so in the beginning, we wanted to create a system because it was hard to find a system that will allow communication between organizations where we can track the individual through the process. Um, I, we thought that was very important to track an individual through the process because a lot of times we send referrals and once they're off and moving, uh, it goes to the next organization and uh, they go to the next organization and we don't hear anything back. So it was important for us to really find something that allowed us to uh, keep hands on with the, with the client, but also pass them on to additional resources, follow up with them and make sure that they were connected and stay connected and, were, and definitely getting the support that they needed. Um, through the process, trying to have it developed, uh, budget wouldn't allow it to be developed or timing, um, but we kept researching, kept researching, and we found Unite Us. And so there's Unite Us Georgia, but you can go and Unite Us is in multiple different states and areas. Um, and one of the beauties of Unite Us is it had a lot of resources already and already there. We didn't have to recruit anyone to um, Unite Us, but we do recruit our partners and the, those that we work with. Uh, for nonprofits, it was free for us to to engage um, uh, um, and to sign up for um, our other partners that are not nonprofits. Um, it was minimal, or what seems minimal, maybe $2,200, I think that's what it was per year um, to access. But what it gives us is it gives us a, a wealth of resources within the city of Atlanta that allows us to refer um, for housing, for uh, mental health, for uh, health services, and anything you think of, food, um, so many different areas, and we can just look it up, and we were able to engage, and as uh, Dr. Rollins said, our partners got in, um, and they started, uh, so it makes it easier for them to refer, and through the system, we were also, they create a form for us that we can embed in our website, and embed everywhere we go, we have a uh, QR code, so this intake system helps us with our by name list. It allows personal information to be um, gathered, the homeless information, their, sta their status of where they're 
um, where they're staying, are they in the city of Atlanta? Um, do we need to provide them with additional resources? What type of supports do they need? And so before we even um, contact the client, all this information is gathered, Conf consent form is already signed um, because they signed it right on the form. And from there, um, we're able to now engage the, the client and talk to them with about their, their current needs, what further needs they have, whether we can support them or not. If we cannot support them, how do we refer them to other uh, agencies? And so this uh, Unita system was really uh, huge. Uh, when we think about the homeless management informa information system, um, we're not trying to recreate the HMIS. We're trying to just take the information that we gather from the HMIS and the network and we wanted to build something that was more intentional. Um, and that's why building the by name list was important. And so as we um, participate, uh, as they wanna participate in the, our research study, or if they wanna find support, they can go to the Redemption Advancements website. There's other websites that have this, this uh, link and it just allows them to, to go through the whole process themselves. We get an email, we follow up. And so it was automated. And what's so good about it is we now get the information and now we refer out and we follow up and now we know where they're at um, in the process. The biggest challenge that we have though, and there's always, you know, sounds great. There's always a challenge though. The challenge is getting other organizations to identify this population intentionally because there's no intentional identification of uh, fathers that are custodial or fathers that have access to their children, but homelessness is, is creating a barrier there. We know that there's a lot of men out there that are fathers that if they, if their living situation was better, then it would help them to engage their children better. Um, but we also know that for us, we're addressing mass incarceration also. So there's a lot of other barriers to getting housing that are there. Through this system that we've uh, identified, that we've uh, built out, and through the resources we're getting, we're able to find agencies that want to work with this population so that they can, you know, get healthy and ultimately for that father get back to their children. Awesome. And so, you know, this isn't a build them, build it and they will come approach we're learning. Um, we initially thought that, okay, we put we put the system together, we have um, a referral, um, we set up this flyer, which doesn't just have QR code, but also our phone numbers, email, different things um, to make sure that folks can reach us and, you know, the information is going to come pouring in. But we're working with a population that's not frequently going um, into these locations and frequently not looking to um, be served well either. And so... Uh, we really do, again, as Thomas said, have to be intentional and we have to seek them out. It's not about, you know, them seeking us as much as it is us reaching out and seeking them um, to make sure they know about this and that this is a resource for them. And so this is taking some time to kind of train and um, educate our partners that, you know, don't just be passive about this, right? And just, well, I didn't see, we didn't see anybody or we don't know anybody. Um, any dads that fit this, ask, you know, be intentional um, about this population so that we make sure that they get connected. Dr. So, Ross, um, sure. Go real ahead. quick, there's a question. There's some questions we can answer live, but this one has to do with this specific thing. So I want to just go ahead and address it. Question is, how do you guarantee privacy and confidentiality of the information on the enrollees? And that's important because we do have multiple agencies that are a part of this, but there's a place when they enroll, before we uh, refer them to another agency, we can click um, a button that says keep information private. And so they cannot see it. There's other um, uh, methods in place that allow information to be private, specific information. So even notes don't have to be shared, um, but the, the base information, the general information that the person is given consent to already, that information is already shared with the other agencies that we refer to. Right. So we're able to pull up um, a client, 
across the different systems based off of this common information that's shared, not the whole kind of record if folks want to restrict information or if the father has asked um, for certain things to be restricted. I see our time is moving, so I'm going to go quickly. We did conduct some interviews with fathers who were referred or they reached out to us about their experience seeking um, housing assistance. Um, and some of these fathers have been seeking assistance for years. We have a father that has been seeking housing assistance since 2017, um, some even before then. Um, the fathers were, they, um, as Thomas alluded to, they, they spoke about their justice-involved backgrounds, which is really a barrier to them getting housing services. Um, also, the fathers frequently talked about their seeking assistance while their children um, or the mother and children um, are staying with family. So family members are taking care of their partner and their children, but they are not allowed to stay in that place or wherever. And so they're seeking help so that the family can be um, reunified and, and together. And so um, those are, you know, kind of heartbreaking situations to hear about. But also some of the fathers, they were not aware of the coordinated entry system per se. And so um, we do try to connect with Partners for Home and other folks to let them know, you know, this dad is needing help. One father did get connected to the coordinated entry system with a housing voucher for rapid rehousing, but then the funding ran out for the program. So it was kind of back to um, trying to find some resources. And so the fathers, you know, really did stress that there are very few helpful resources. Um, they couldn't really note a lot of things, um, some did say church, some did, of course, you know, say that this program was helpful and things like that, but the housing part is the key. And so without that need being met, it was really hard to um, see themselves as being helped per se. And so um, we also asked fathers why they might not seek assistance. And so um, this is what one of the fathers shared. He said, you don't think you are ever going to get help. You sometimes come in contact with a couple of bad agencies. They don't do too much for you, which discourages you. And it's hard for men to believe that there is assistance for them. They don't believe the system is going to work for them. Um, and if you don't fall into the categories of being mentally ill, being a veteran, being a drug addict, any kind of dysfunction, it just doesn't seem like there's hope for you. So just an average father just <laughs> trying to get help, um, it, it is really difficult. Some of the feedback that we receive from our providers, from our partners um, who are working with the Unite Us system, we'll hear from one in a, in a moment, um, but um, really the system is promising. They do agree that it's better than some previous processes or just, you know, picking up the phone and whatever, which we do still have to pick up the phone sometimes now. This is high tech, but it also needs to be high touch as well. So, um, but anyway, we're all thankful that the um, coalition members, our partners are all on board. Um, and they want to continue to work with us to really address this issue and um, effectively and collaboratively end homelessness for fathers in Atlanta. These are um, two quotes from our partners. Uh, Rush is the only system of its kind that's tailored towards active fathers, fathers who choose to be the head of the family and the system that will help Black fathers um, have the courage to ask for help. And then as a healthcare partner, I look forward to identifying and testing novel methods to identify fathers experiencing homelessness in our healthcare facilities. And once identified, having those effective resources uh, with the client can then be connected. So these are just some um, opportunities that we're looking forward to um, continue to share this work, continue to do the work um, at a uh, upcoming conference later on this month, a fatherhood conference. Um, we're also excited, you know, beyond the, you know, professional scientific things, but being able to just talk with our community, talking with Fathers Matter ATL partners. Um, we've been invited also to talk with Morehouse Healthcare um, physicians and um, pediatrics and all of these various departments to share about this work. So again, folks can be intentional about identifying these fathers um, and helping them too. All right. Now, um, thank you so much for your attention with that. I'm definitely going to give the floor over to one of our social services partners and fathers, Mr. Chris White. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you all for uh, this presentation. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Happy to be a part of it. Um, as far as what I can add to this conversation, I would say that um, 
some of the major challenges uh, with fathers who are facing this have, have been expressed already. But another thing on our end is that, yes, we're not collecting a lot of this information um, because um, there, there really isn't the support on the back end to do it. And then also when we do serve fathers and try to provide them with housing resources, it's very frustrating because it's kind of a movable target. You know, you may find somebody that has some housing resources one moment, and then you go back a couple of weeks later and it's no longer available. So it's very difficult for us to actually find reliable resources for our fathers. Um, it was pointed out that there's a hesitancy to even go seek services where you might get a label. And that label may serve you in, in the short term and help you with housing, but it may hurt you later on. Um, when you have some sort of mental health label. Um, so there are a lot of challenges with housing. Um, the uh, Unite Us tool has been really good for us. Um, we're, we're just starting to really get into it, but the referrals that I've sent over to the Rush program have had a level of transparency that I don't get anywhere else. So I know what's going on with these individuals and that's always very helpful. In fact, um, sometimes you need to tag team individuals where the connection's not made. So then it's, you know, if I would truly wanna help then let's try to follow back up. Some of these folks are a little more difficult to serve um, but they do deserve the support and the service. So that's been really good. Um, it's also helped me to expand my the way I, in which I deliver uh, services to fathers in general. Because of the tool, I can um, send it off to families uh, on first contact, and they can fill out the information and get entered into the system through a self-referral, which is helpful because we have a lot of different things that we are doing and a lot of different ways we can help people. Um, a lot of people demanding our attention. And so it's really, you know, having um, a focus on housing um, that, that's really important for us. So the tool allows me to do that, to really collect more of their needs and then make uh, really quality referrals beyond that. I did hear that we were short on time. So I think that's it for me. Is that right, Dr. Rollins? If you have more to share, you're welcome <laughs> to share. <laughs> No, I, I was just trying to breeze through it. Um, I, I'm obviously wide open to any questions people have as far as what I experience um, working with fathers and kind of how I've been using this. But uh, yeah, I, I think I planned on just going quickly here. So hopefully I did that. Thank you so much, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is all for, for our presentation. Um, I see there are a lot of questions in the chat. So you know, I don't know, Karen, if you want to facilitate that or if you want us to just go through and answer. Yeah, absolutely. So I think first, I just want to thank you for coming back and providing this update and everything that you're doing. And it's, it's really, really important work. And I can tell for some, from some of the questions and all the love that we're getting from the reactions that um, this work resonates with a lot of people that have joined today. And um, I see that we even have someone joining from Germany. So, um, so thank you for coming in and doing this presentation. I know we are a little bit short on time, but we have seven minutes to do some questions. Um, if anyone else has questions, I know we, we keep saying that we have a lot of them that have come in. Please don't hesitate to still put them in. We can provide all of the unanswered questions that we don't have time to, to the research team, and um, we can have them follow up to answer you. So with that, I think, Dr. Rollins, we can do one of two things. Either I can go through and moderate some questions for you, or if there are any questions that you have seen pop up that you really want to answer, I think it would be a, a good time for you to just answer those. Okay. Um, Lisa, are you, me, so you all, yeah, I knew it. I knew you're in yeah. it, so go ahead. <laughs> there, there was one that I, I responded um by typing, but I do want to address. Um, the question was, are there any promising partnerships with housing authority to designate vouchers to this population? And housing, Atlanta Housing is a, a partner of ours, and they were willing to provide vouchers to our fathers. They're willing to work with a lot of programs that are addressing needs, um, important needs, especially um, in the city of Atlanta. The challenge with the city of Atlanta and probably in a lot of metro areas uh, across the country is that even when fathers receive these vouchers, the challenge is to find safe and affordable housing. 
Um, you know, they may even be able to find unsafe housing, but that's even a challenge these days with vouchers. And so we have to create, um, we, we have to look into things in a different way and find different creative ways of housing fathers that are custodial fathers with their children who are trying to, and especially when we talk about justice impacted fathers, you don't want to put them back in an element where they're, they're challenged and they have, they're around all different types of elements that can possibly impact their freedom. And so there's so many different ways of looking at this and it's not, you know, even though having a voucher can help out, there's so many other factors that we have to consider when it comes to housing fathers. Are there any others you see? I'm, I'm going through it too. Um, what non-traditional partners have you uh, reached out to to help identify this population, um, faith-based leaders and um, community centers? So as a part of, of Fathers Matter ATL, we do have faith-based leaders. We have other community-based organizations. We have the Y. Um, so there's a number of, of different partners outside of the medical um, social services and public health partners that we're working with to identify these fathers. Let's see. Are you open to new systems developed by grassroots organizations to build upon this awareness um, nationally as well as, okay, go ahead, Carrington. I'm just clearing the questions out. I think you will have a much better answer than, than I will. Dr. Oh. Oh, okay. The, sorry. The note says Carrington would like to answer this question. So <laughs> I was like, well, go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, absolutely. We're open, open to new systems um, to really increase awareness about this issue. Um, yeah, for sure. So and even if we increase the awareness for this issue, it kind of goes to the housing developers and funding that can be used to develop family friendly and ha housing for this population. It's awareness and we have to continue to build. Um, what we've started in our research process, as well as providing tools back to this process, I think is a great start. We just need to keep the momentum going and eventually we'll find the partners and the ways to really highlight this, this group of fathers that absolutely need the help. I see one question that I think is interesting. Do you mind if I ask it? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's the one from Barbara Sykes and she asks what behavior and attitude or narrative changes can public health and social service organizations do internally when addressing some of the barriers for fathers? I find this question interesting also because of something that you mentioned in the webinar where you were saying even the definition of, of um, homelessness differs upon all the different organizations. So that just definition changes and, and kind of misunderstanding among organizations. Um, I'm curious how that kind of plays into behavior and attitude changes that mm -hmm. might have come up in your project. Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. That that was a, a huge issue for us because we were like, oh, you know, okay, that's another barrier, just the definition in of itself. Um, but I think what, what happens first or what needs to be addressed first um, is is bias, you know, in terms of how people see men. Um, you know, I, I just in early conversations before we even um, receive word that we we have received this amazing funding, um, early conversations, folks were like, "Well, you know, there's women that can't get housing." Like, yes, that's terrible too, you know. But that doesn't mean <laughs> that we don't. Um, also acknowledge that this needs to be addressed as well, you know? So there's this, um, um, yeah, just kind of like a, well, it, it doesn't really happen. It's, it's rare, you know? So why should we really focus in on that? Um, so that's kind of an attitude that, that folks a lot of time will take. So just dealing with that personal bias of it's not really important, it's not really an issue, that has been a barrier for us to just even get the partnerships and get people going to really see this is something that we need to work on together. Um, but it's it's historic. I mean, a lot of these systems are not designed or or made to help men generally. Like you said, it's really looking at at mothers and children, which is you know eighty three percent of the population that serve um, in these programs. And so when you 
start to insert <laughs> men, it's kind of folks thinking they have to do something different, which they do. And a lot of times that creates resistance. And so, um, so we're just, yeah, just trying to keep highlighting the um, stories of these fathers that these are, you know, these are parents um, highlighting the outcomes. They're, they're linked to children, you know, they're linked to, you know, a lot of different um, positive outcomes that can happen if we help them, you know, so uh, really trying to personalize a lot of this stuff has been how we've tried to change the narrative. Or reclaim Dr. It. Rollins, can we allow yeah. Chris a quick moment to discuss oh, that? Yeah. Because that's, his, that's definitely his space. Absolutely. Could you repeat the question for me real quick, Thomas? I was trying to grab it. Um, yes, they were asking about what are some of the um, narratives that need to change, particularly in public health and social service services for us to really address some of the barriers that these fathers are experiencing. I, I think you did touch on uh, the, the very definition of what homeless is. Um, why do we have to wait for somebody to be on the street um, to serve them when we know, I know like how fragile a housing situation is. And especially when we're talking about fathers, meaning people responsible for children, they need stability. So we definitely need to change that and just allow fathers um, to get help a little earlier and provide some stability for their children. Um, just fear. There's there's a fear in working with men. And um, I understand that. But I think we need to um, have a, a layer of um, not sophistication. We need to dig a little deeper on it. You know, we need to identify who's a threat and who is not, because not all men are unsafe. Um, and it's unfair to men to be punished by the few that do have some issues and do cause some, uh, you know, unsafe environments. So I would say those are two major ones. Um, does anybody have anything else they want to add to that? I'm just thinking about the barriers, period, when it comes to the system, when it comes to mm -hmm. the, the system of the way they engage um, mothers versus fathers, there's already a narrative, and we're looking through Fathers Matter ATL to change the narrative about men. There's a lot of different things that we're doing to behind the scenes with the seven different strategies so that we can change this, this narrative and you know address some of the barriers the policies, the, there's so many different things behind the scenes that will help out with this housing issue um, if we were able to change those things. So that's all I had to add. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you all. I know you're all putting in the work to change this narrative and to, to help this population. So we appreciate you. Um, and thanks for, again for coming and presenting on your work and for just talking about this because it sounds like a lot of people are very interested in the work that you're doing and um, hopefully they will stay tuned with other future research and progress webinars or other products that are coming out of your, your research. Um, thank you again for attending our research and progress webinar today. Like I said, I will send out an email with a link to the recording as well as a PDF to the slides. And I think we'll go ahead and conclude here since we're a couple minutes past the hour. But thank you again for presenting and for joining. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day.